there are some genealogical and geographical links between the reform of the 16th century in southern France and the Albigenses of the two former or three former centuries. The historical researchers are proving today that the Albigensian faith lasted more time than what was thought. Some vestiges of them remain for the year 1329 when four of them were burned at the stake. The same happened during the 14th century and beginning of the 15th century in the southern lands which today belong to France. This is what was found in the records of the Inquisition in Carcassonne. There, a condemnation of Cathars was mentioned in the surrounding areas, which took place in 1335. Another in 1340, in 1352, and in 1364. In the very Carcassonne, there are similar records between 1352 and 1400, and even in 1422. The condemnations of the Inquisition in Carcassonne begin again in 1531 and 1547, now with Protestants. One of the inquisitorial books contains mention of condemnations for heresy from 1324 to 1328 and from 1536 to 1552, as if no centuries would have elapsed. The Catholic kings reorganized for that time the Holy Office of the Inquisition and established one of its courts in Barcelona. Researchers are now working on those records not very known until recent times. That inquisitorial court of Barcelona detected Protestants in its territory to whom the inquisitors persecuted and condemned in 1539, 1552, and especially in 1560. From the 354 condemned by the Holy Office in Barcelona since the years 1539 to 1598, between the 29 to 32 percent had names that belonged to former Occitan Cathars, who had been condemned more than one century and a half earlier. These 354 condemned witness of a Protestant population integrated, pacific, though regularly persecuted. Two years before the Saint Bartholome massacre, that court of Barcelona was working on a list of 1,200 heretics which recovered all the high section of the country. This and many other equivalent data show us that the Protestant Huguenots sat in the same houses and places where two centuries before the Cathars met, and sometimes with the same names. Michel Jass reports that more of 10,000 patronymic names prove today the sanguineous link between the old Albigenses who were processed and the later Protestants in the same territory that once belonged to the friends of God. This allows us to see that, though permanently persecuted and very weakened, an almost uninterrupted underground faith survived in all the Languedoc. We have not to forget that since the middle of the 11th century, the name of the father is written in genitive and becomes hereditary. And toward the 12th century, the nobles added to their name of baptism and or to the name surname inherited, the place of fortified residency. For this reason, the patronymic connection can be established today easily. Two centuries later, the rural aristocracy living in the western Languedoc opted twice for Protestantism. In the anonymous Protestant Manifest of 1703, impressed in Holland and distributed in the Sevens, we read, the people of the Sevens had always remained in their professed religion, several centuries before the Reformation. Their country was seen in other times full of Waldensians and Albigenses, if we have to distinguish among them. It seems by diverse acts 
that they profess the same religion than the current reformers. Their zeal was reignited as the beginning of the reform. In less than nothing, all that country was reformed and has been since that time. The Occitan Qatar sources of the Colloquium of Montreal contain recovered manuscripts of the Qatar by the Protestant Huguenots, which shows a different viewpoint from those found in the Catholic chronicles of the Middle Ages. These documents were copied, translated, and dispersed to save them from the destruction of the inquisitors. Thanks to these documents, the churches coming from the reformers could identify themselves with the Albigenses and the Waldenses. Another significant fact that can be proven today is the deportation of people from the cities in southern France after the repression of the papal crusades intended to exterminate them. In the Museum of the Inquisition at Carcassonne, there are several instruments of torture that explain why, between the 13th and 16th centuries, many cities in the south had been diminished by half. This is what Michel Jazz wrote in his book. There were horrendous massacres that destroyed entire populations, according to what we have already seen, and those who were able to escape had to flee to other countries. After the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, the extermination of the Huguenots reached also into the south, and from 1549 to 1560, many Protestants emigrated to Geneva. Between 1600 and 1800 Huguenots were condemned between May 24 and December 17 in the year 1562. Now, let us consider the consequences of uh, these massacres in later centuries. I mean, the, the gloom that settled upon the air during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished, wrote Ellen G. White. In every age there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who hallowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented or mutilated. Yet they stood firm and from age to age maintain their faith in its purity as a sacred heritage for their generations to come. Another statement of the spirit of prophecy. The history of God's people during the ages of darkness that followed upon Rome's supremacy is written in heaven, but they have little place in human records. Few traces of their existence can be found except in the accusations of their persecutors. It was the policy of Rome to obliterate every trace of descent from her doctrines or decrees. Everything heretical, whether persons or writings, she sought to destroy. Expressions of doubt or questions as to the authority of papal dogmas were enough to forfeit the life of rich or poor, high or low. Rome endeavored also to destroy every record of her cruelty toward dissenters. Papal councils decreed that books and writings containing such records should be committed to the flames. Before the invention of printing, books were few in number and in a form not favorable for preservation. Therefore, there was little to prevent the Romanists from carrying out their purpose. The church in the desert, the few descendants of the ancient Christians that still lingered in France in the 18th century, hiding away in the mountains of the south, still cherished the faith of their fathers. 
as they ventured to meet by night on mountainside or lonely moor. They were chased by dragoons and dragged away to lifelong slavery in the galleys. The purest, the most refined, and the most intelligent of the French were chained in horrible tortures amidst robbers and assassins. Others more mercifully dealt with were shot down in cold blood as, unarmed and helpless, they fell upon their knees in prayer. Hundreds of aged men, defenseless women, and innocent children were left dead upon the earth at their place of meeting. In traversing the mountainside or the forest, where they had been accustomed to assemble, it was not unusual to find an, at every four paces dead bodies dotting the sword and corpses hanging suspended from the trees. Their country, laid waste with the sword, the axe, the fagot, was converted into one vast gloomy wilderness. But a blind and inexorable bigotry chased from her soil every teacher of virtue, every champion of order, every honest defender of the throne. It said to the men who would have made their country a renown and glory in the earth, choose with which you will have, a stake or exile. At last, the ruin of the state was complete. There remained no more conscience to be proscribed, no more religion to be dragged to the stake, no more patriotism to be chased into banishment. And the revolution, with all its horrors, was the dire result. The gospel would have brought to France the solution of those political and social problems that baffled the skill of her clergy, her king, and her legislator, and finally plunged the nation into anarchy and ruin. By working upon the jealousy of the kings and the ruling classes, Rome had influenced them to keep the people in bondage, well knowing that the state would thus be weakened and purposing by this means to fasten both rulers and people in her throne. With far-sighted policy, she perceived that in order to enslave men effectually, the shackles must be bound upon their souls, that the surest way to prevent them from escaping their bondage was to render them incapable of freedom. Unhappy France reaped in blood the harvest she hath sown. Terrible were the results of her submission to the controlling power of Rome. Where France, under the influence of Romanism, had set up the first stake at the opening of the Reformation, there the Revolution set up its first guillotine. On the very spot where the first martyrs to the Protestant faith were burned in the 16th century, the first victims were guillotined in the 18th. In repelling the Gospel, which would have brought her healing, France had opened the door to infidelity and ruin. When the restraints of God's law were cast aside, it was found that the laws of man were inadequate to hold in check the powerful tides of human passion, and the nation swept on to revolt and anarchy. The war against the Bible inaugurated an era which stands in the world's history as the reign of terror. All too well the people had learned the lessons of cruelty and torture which Rome had so diligently taught. A day of retribution at last hath come. It was not now the disciples of Jesus that were thrust into dungeons and dragged to the stake. Long ago this hath perished or been driven into exile. And Spain in Rome now felt the deadly power of those whom he sha he ha she had trained to delight in deeds of blood. The example of persecution which the clergy of France had exhibited for so many ages was now retorted upon them with signal vigor. The scaffolds ran red with the blood of the priest. The galleys and the prisons, once crowded with Huguenots, were now filled with their persecutors. Chained to the bench and toiling at the oar, 
the Roman Catholic clergy experienced all those woes which their church had so freely inflicted on the Gentile heretics. How long did the people wait to obtain freedom of conscience? This is a legitimate question. An Albigensian troubadour sang in the 13th century, every 700 years the laurel will be reborn. That song is interpreted by many as a prophecy, because everywhere in that region the friends of God are now vindicated by many. The pejorative term, Qatar, worshippers of the rear end of a cat, is today a symbol of freedom, nobility, determination, and devotion to God. They are eulogized as people who were willing to die rather than renounce the principles of freedom. Many still cannot find an answer for such a cruel massacre. It was not necessary to wait another 700 years for the proclamation of the freedom of conscience that the friends of Jesus or good men, as they call themselves or consider themselves, had claimed. Luther came 300 years later and in 1521, at the Diet of Worms, he declared before the emperor and the princes of Christianity that he would not recant because it was unworthy for any Christian to act against his conscience. This was considered horrible, sacrilege, by the Catholic world. Even today, many Catholics don't read anything without consulting the priest. In fact, during the Protestant Reformation, the papacy prepared an index of forbidden books. Before whom or what would Luther submit his conscience? Before the Holy Word of God, but not before the many contradictory councils of Christendom. Though some Protestants themselves applied the Roman whip to others in some cases, the principle of freedom was growing till in 1776 the Protestant and Republican American Declaration of Independence was proclaimed. From that time on, those principles of freedom were again ingrown in the world at an accelerated pace. A few years later, the atheistic French Revolution, with all of its successes and terrors, hurled down all religion and imposed the goddess of reason. That happened in 1789. But the principles of secular freedom brought about by this revolution placed human rights before the rights of God so badly represented for so many centuries by the dominant religious power. In 1798, General Berthier of the Napoleonic army went to Rome and took Pope Pius VI prisoner, declaring that no other authority would come from the Papal See. No foreign army came to defend the Pope. The prophecy of Revelation 13 had foretold it as being the deadly blow against the political authority of the Roman Antichrist at the end of the 1260 days, symbolic years, 600 years after the papal genocide against the Albigenses. David I. Kerser, in his book The Pope Who Would Be King, The Exile of Pius IX, and The Emergence of Modern Europe, he wrote it in the year 1218, he summarized that deadly blow in the following words. As Napoleon's forces swept through the papal states and laid waste the papal government, two popes were, one after the other, removed by force from Rome and driven into exile by French troops. Pius VI, exiled from Rome in 1798, died the next year in Valence, France. The conclave to elect his successor, Pius VII, was held not in Rome, where the end of papal rule had been proclaimed, but in Venice. Although Pius VII was briefly allowed back to Rome in 1809, he too was seized by French troops and taken to France. In his book, Kerzet affirms that Pius IX in the second half of the 19th century, was the last Pope King. 
It is striking that he speaks of the political earthquake that has shaken Europe since the French Revolution a half century earlier. Kerzer doesn't know that he employed a term that the Apostle John used to portray the same event that would take place at the conclusion of the medieval oppression. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tent of the city collapsed. Revelation 11, verse 13. Also, Ellen G. White referred to the same event by saying that France was shaken as if by an earthquake in the book The Great Controversy. The tenth part of the oppressing earthly apocalyptic city has to do with the fall of one of the ten tribes of European kingdoms which were allied with the Roman Catholic religions for 1290 years since the first king of the Franks, Clovis, founded his capital in Paris under a system which linked the state with the Catholic religion. That political secular earthquake would later spill over to all of Europe and the entire world, shaking all religious predominance, be it Buddhist, Confucianist, Muslim, or heathen. What was the essence of that political earthquake? Clemens Metternich, Chancellor of the Austrian Empire, who supported Pope Pius IX, understood it well. The world rises up against the very idea of such a government, represented by the Pope in his papal states, theocratic. The Catholic world is based on the principle of authority, while the, world, while the world does not want such an authority. The world wants civil equality and authority based on the will of the people.